Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Pod Scum. This is the podcast where we dive into the deepest, darkest, murkiest of waters with our legendary guests. And speaking of legends, I am your host, the number one scumbag, your bastard of ceremonies, Rex Ruger. That's Rex with three X's. Count them one, two, three for the extra sleazy. You might also know me as the man with the uh, golden voice and the velvet tongue, a.k.a. the king of sleaze, a.k.a. the hair metal high priest, and most importantly, a.k.a. Diamond David Lee Roth Jr. And I just spoke to my attorney today, and the concrete proof will be here soon that you're looking at the spawn of Diamond Dave. That's right, I am the son of glam, the front man for the band. Just smoked a few grams. Mr. Wham Bam, thank you, ma'am. Got a million fans. Always going out with a bang. Shazam. Hot damn. Wah, ba, 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 bam, bam. Whew. I'm feeling good. And if you want to look like the man and you want the locks that rock, get yourself the product that does it all, baby. <laughs> Let me give myself a look before we get our great guest in here. I'm looking good from all sides. Of course, this is the No Frills podcast. You don't get no frills because you get the thrills right here. I'm a 49-year-old man working this internet thing, so I do the best I can. You don't get no Motley Crue uh, kiss-style uh, podcast here. You see me working the, the uh, technology, half-assed and all. That's what I do. And I also am the hardest working man in show business, fronting numerous glam and sleaze bands up and down the eastern seaboard. But my main focus right now is Love Sword, and I'm looking for players. So if you want to be behind the greatest front man to ever do it, hit me up in the comments section. Anyway, enough about me. Let's get into our guest here. Huh? And we got ourselves a good one. I hope. Yeah. Just got to. Can you hear me now? I, we got you now, Kostya. Yeah. Kostya, Kostya Varvatakis. Kostya Varvatakis. Varvatakis. Barbatakis. So I should be boning up on my, uh, uh, what is that? Is that Greek? Greek. Greek. Kostya yeah. from, from phenomenal. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it for you. Let me toot your horn for you. Phenomenal thrash metal band, Hatriot. Not, not Hat Riot, Hatriot. Hatriot. Right? You can, yes. Although you can call us Hat Riot if you wish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I we mean, whatever works. We call ourselves that sometimes. As long as somebody's saying your name, right? That's what really matters, right? Oh, sure. You want your name on people's lips. Anyway, uh, so, uh, so first of all, man, you know, uh, on Massacre Records, that's great, first of all, right? Having label support in this day and age in the music business. Uh, the last album, uh, Veil of Shadows, just came out. It's a fucking ripper. Fantastic guitar work by you on that album. Um, what was it like taking over this band after... Uh, after Zetro was there, because he leaves a pretty big footprint there, though, right? I mean, he's a thrash legend. Well, yeah. I mean, for me, it was uh, so originally we uh, we were going to try and have him do double duty, you know, right? Do Exodus and Hatred, and then right. we had Cody fill in on a couple of shows, and we're just like, screw it, dude. Cody just do vocals, and we can just let Zet be in Exodus because that's where he belongs. And yeah, he does. Yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how we went about it, you know. Is and it then met up with him and you know gave him his papers <laughs> is it pretty cool though being in a band like do that you know do zetro's boys i mean obviously they're playing thrash music ben but are they like what you what we would think of as like you know kind of a chip off the old block i mean do they eat live and breathe this thrash music like zetro seems to do um you know what's funny is uh nick more so nick is more yeah. into thrash metal cody he'll he'll even say this himself you know he listens to like the essentials like exodus and testament and stuff yeah like that. But Cody's yeah. way more into like a lot of more techie stuff and like a lot more like one of his favorite bands is Black Dahlia Murder. Like he's okay. a Black Dahlia guy. He likes a lot of that stuff. Uh, you know, that more I, I don't want to say deathcore, but you know, that kind of more like tech death, some somewhat deathcore stuff. Yep, yep. That's more Cody's bag. And me I yeah, remember I remember talking to you not that long ago, and there was a quote um, uh, on the internet. This is probably beginning our, our uh, beginning or middle of July, where uh, uh, somebody on uh, so social media or some platform had to, had referred to you guys, and uh, I think we had discussed this as an Exodus Exodus ripoff with Arch Enemy solos. Yeah. You absolutely hate in today's world because me being a forty nine year old guy, I'm kind of old school where all these genres and subgenres didn't exist. 
Is it just is it is there too many metal snobs out there right now that are just looking to put every act into a specific box? Um, and criticize you know everything. What? You know what? Um, I don't even know anymore. There's a subgenre for everything. I there really is. I don't know how to answer that. I mean, to me, I kind of just break it down into five. As far as heavy metal goes, like metal is a genre. Right, I break right. it down into five genres: your death metal, your thrash metal, your black metal, your just regular metal yeah. or your shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe you can throw in Grindcore in there, too. Grindcore is a little bonus one. Yeah. But all Grindcore is is just shorter death metal songs to me. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, all these other shop subgenres like, you know, progressive doom sludge and all that stuff. Just like, bro, you're not special. You don't yeah. need to classify yourself. I know. You know. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. Make good music and whatever it sounds like, that sound is your band. Be a rock band. Yeah. Um, uh, do you ever get the sense off of working with, uh, with Cody and Nick that they themselves, uh, feel any kind of pressure, uh, of carrying, uh, some sort of a symbolic torch, you know, from their father, that, that they have some kind of like great responsibility to, you know, to come out and really blow people away because they are Zetro's boys. I, I, I mean, we all kind of, since Zet was in the band too, I mean, we all kind of have to have that drive that, right. Because. We don't have to be like i don't mean to discredit like zet has set the bar so high that we have no choice without him we have to be better we have to right. be better than we were with him in the band right we don't have to be uh so we all we are all are very driven in the sense that uh you know yeah we just have to be better we have to be as good as if not better than any of those older bands and it's really hard because you know those guys have been doing it longer than we've been alive yeah so, right right Lots of lot, lots of homework. Let me just yeah, say that. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Uh, I mean, going into this at first, even me as a guitar player, like yeah, I, within a finger snap, it was no longer my competition was other local guitarists. My competition was everyone I looked up to. Right, right, so right. Like, you know, you really got to put your head to the grindstone on that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about your upbringing, though. Um, yeah, um, you know, for, um, for people that don't know a lot about, like, you know, what it's like to grow up in a, in a, in a, in what I'm, I'm assuming is a traditional Greek household. Um, Very. Uh, were there other expectations on you, and 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 what were your folks' reaction to you're going to become a musician? Are they like the kind of parents who were like, Coach is going to be a doctor, Coach is going to be a a lawyer, Coach is going to be our next senator? <laughs> You know what? No, they never really. I got to give credit to my folks, is they never set the expectation too high. I mean, you know, they like any other parent, they wanted me to go to college and stuff like that, and maybe become a doctor or a lawyer or something. They wouldn't argue with that, but right. you know, they knew early on that I probably wasn't going down that route. I was kind of more, you know, and I really did set up a career for myself. Honestly, you got to have your safety net if you're going to do this, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I got into fixing cars. Um, I tried other things too, but. No, my parents were just like, you know what, the way they, on all in all, in a nutshell, went about it was, do you can do whatever you want as soon as you can support yourself, then you can do whatever you want. You That's know? the key. That's the key. Yeah. Yeah. So as long as you're, as long as you can, you know, keep a roof over your head and, you know, then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Just don't, just don't let anything ruin your life. You know what I mean? And, I'm sure when I first when I started my first band when I was like 16, they weren't necessarily the most thrilled, because you know. Right, right. But, but again, my my father is a musician as well. He plays traditional Cretan music, and I do that too. I actually okay. got later on. I play the lute. He plays a lyre. Um, but you know, as far as growing up goes, it was just your typical like old school Greek household. You know, my really tight with my family to this day. Uh, you know, it wasn't a bad upbringing. Stern sometimes, but I mean, you know, stern for a reason. Okay, so when you say stern, though, when you say stern, um, um, when you started to discover heavy music, uh, did you did you have the type of parents that tried to put limitations at, or, oh. or 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 disapprove of stuff you listened to? No, um, no. I got into me. I got into metal because my older sisters and my cousins and stuff. You know. Okay. My older sisters, you know, back in those, days, especially my oldest, she uh. She uh, had Columbia House back in the day, so she would. She, there would be a plethora of new heavy metal music coming. Yeah, in. I remember. I I remember the cassettes for a penny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> twelve yeah. of them or whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, from what I was told, that's how a lot of people mess their credit up. But, oh yeah. Uh, 
um, so, you know, they, they would have like the posters and stuff like that. So, you know, that's kind of how I got into heavy metal. And my cousins too, you know, I grew up around like Slayer, Megadeth, Iron Maiden and Slayer and, you know, even Misfits and some punk rock stuff and Typo Negative and Dan's. I grew up, I grew up with like some metal stuff around me already. My parents, you know, didn't like it necessarily, but, you know, they're not going to, they, they weren't sheltering us to the point of, oh, no, you can't listen to this. I think it was because the argument uh, the argument my older sister made was it's either this or rap music. They're like, oh, by all means. <laughs> so, so, so I've talked to, uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough uh, on my podcast here to talk to some of the veterans in the thrash metal scene, guys from Violence, guys from Flotsam and Jetsam, various, uh, various other uh, stalwarts in the thrash metal world or whatever. And when I usually talk to them about up and coming bands who are helping keep the scene alive, you know, and, and there are a good handful of young thrash bands out there, Municipal Waste, Ex Mortis, Havoc. You, you guys always come up and you always come up seemingly as one of the ones that they're touting and flying the flag for very heavily. I don't know if some of it's because of the connection with Zetro, but whether or not it is or 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 not, is that is that a lot of pressure? The, the, the fact that the veteran guys are looking at you as, as, as those guys that are going to take the torch and run with it and keep Thrash, you know, alive. It's not pressure. It's uh, more of an honor than anything. I mean, yeah, God. I, I'm kind of speechless on that whole thing because, like, you know, yeah, I, I feel like we should be flying the flag, at, at least, you know, amongst the Bay Area bands. There's there's a few of us out there, but there's it, – it's really hard for these younger bands, too, to, you know, keep keep up. Municipal's bit Municipal, I don't really consider a younger band. They've been around for almost 20 years now. <laughs> right, that's true. I know, but, I know. Uh, they always mention the younger bands of Thrash. At any page you go to to see who's up and coming in Thrash, it seems like Municipal Waste has been there for like a, a decade plus. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just a – we, we, we mostly just use it to drive us. Like, we we take that title – and we're running with it. We we yeah. are going to be the future of thrash metal. We, I mean, who else is doing? Who else can can do it besides us or Ex Mortis or, right? You know, like Havoc, like you said. We're the even a Warbringer too. Like when you really look into it, as far as newer thrash bands go that are actually trying to do the damn thing, there's not that many of us. Right. And even even now, our sound is kind of shifting towards something a little bit more of our own. But there's still the thrash element there. Is the sound is the sound that you just mentioned that's shifting? Is it shifting by design, or is this something natural that's happening, or are you guys sitting around orchestrating a change in sound? Um, you know what? So this is this is how I like to point it out. Like the first two albums had to just be straight up thrash. I mean, Zetra right. singing on them. No, you know right. what I mean. No one wants to hear like Zet trying to sing on a metalcore song. Right, People right, want to right. right. Zetro thrash. does what he does. Yeah, Zetro does what he does, and he's the best at it. And that's he is. Why. Bay Area Thrash. Agreed. Agreed. You know I'll even I'll even admit it. My first two albums were modeled heavily off of Exodus. Yeah. Yeah. Were, and yeah. you know, testament in there too. Um, then when Days into Darkness so still has that element heavily, but then when he left the band, I uh, or when you know we kind of just went our separate ways, you can kind of hear a shift of us getting a little more technical. And then this album, I just was like, fuck it. We we need to be our own thing. We're I'm gonna yeah. write whatever I think. I'm gonna write whatever we have to write, and right. whatever comes out comes out. And funny enough, this is our best received album. Yeah, well, it's a ripper for sure. I mean, it's a it's a and it's it's an absolute uh it, it's an absolute monster from start to finish. And I think that's the key too is that. Uh, you know, the market has changed so much. So I'm interesting. I'm interested to get your take on like how you see uh, Hatred going forward. Um, you know, because people are putting out music in different forms, people like to either do singles or EPs or full length albums. Whoa, what vein do you see Hatred going down? Uh, you, you guys like putting out a full length, fully realized 10, 12 songs at a time or EPs or. We we do like doing that. Um, you know the the singles and stuff only work for bands that are a lot bigger. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. You you know if you're like a if you're like a two thousand person a night artist, yeah, you could just put out a song every month and keep yourself hot, constantly right? Because someone right. can pick up on it. Us, we're not quite at that level yet. We got to give people, you know, we got to do the album and then tour tour on it or do do something with it for the next few years and then spit out another album and do something for it. That, you know, right. 
it's building steps. Once you do hit a certain level, though, yeah, you can survive off singles. I, I know plenty of bands that do that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I believe uh, they're not metal at all, but a good example of a band that's just been putting out singles consistently would be uh, Falling in Reverse. Yep, yep. They, I, I'm not sure if they put an album out, but I do know that they've just been putting singles out, and that's been doing really well for them. So, like, if you're a band of that size, then, of course, you know, just putting a single out every couple months or whatever just keeping yourself hot on that chart you know it works for you but is it tough though is it tough to is it tough to be inspired and kicked in and put out 10 or 10 to 12 to 13 great songs though knowing that the attention span of the uh, uh, you know of the people has just dropped so much that people are just looking for those two or three catchy songs and that's all they want to hear well they well they just want to hear those two or three catchy songs that's still them listening to us right 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 i i, I hate that because i'm an old school guy who likes to put an album on and listen to it start to finish you know i mean and experience it the way i think the artist intended it for it to be listened to yeah you well, know i mean that's all up to the listener at that point either way they're listening to us and either way they're right. a fan of us. that's how right I right right they want to just listen to the singles that's great listen to the singles if you want to buy the album awesome buy the album you want to just buy a, listen to us on iTunes or Spotify? Right. Become a monthly listener and listen to us. It, it, yeah. it works out for us either way. As long as you like the music we're putting out, I don't care. What is the creative process like when Hatred gets together? Does somebody come in with music? Does somebody come in with lyrics? Is it is it kind of a, 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 a just a huge collaboration? Do you guys get in a room and play together? How does the creative process start for you guys? Most of the time I sit in front of my computer with some recording stuff and I write songs, I write them, I program the drums, and then I present it to the guys. And if they like it, we move forward. If they don't, I go back to the drawing board. Um, usually Nick and Cody will, uh, uh, Nick, Cody and Kevin will handle lyrics or uh, most of the time, Nick and Cody will handle lyrics. You know, sometimes I do it. Lyrics is kind of a free for all really, but most, most of the time it's the other guys doing that because I'm busy writing the actual music. Um, it's a really easy process. It's been like that since day one. I write everything, and then someone takes it and writes lyrics to it. Right. Um, who are some guys? And I'm sure you've gotten this question before too. But who are some guys who who who's playing as a as a guitar player yourself? Who are some guys? Not like that you idolized or whatever. But who are some guys who's who's playing? No matter what, what genre they're in, who are some guitar players that you just enjoy listening to their playing, metal or otherwise? Oh, oh man, there's a lot of them. Uh, just guys I listen to, I'll just do guys I'm listening to uh, as of late, which aren't really that current, but Mick Sweeta from uh, fucking Bullet Boys. I just had him on the other day. Yeah. I just had him on the podcast, and he spent about a little over an hour with me, man, and just a great guy. And I'll tell you what, he's got an album out that just came out called, uh, a, a band called The Hot Summers. Uh -huh. And this is really an album that you could literally just takes you back to like just good 70s hard rock where you just put it on in a car, drop the top, and just go somewhere and just, you know, barbecues and beer type music. I oh. love Big Speeda. Great guy. Dude, he, he's, he, I, I've been listening to the Bullet Boys a lot lately. And dude, his guitar work on that album is awesome. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Yeah, a very talented guy. And 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 a lot of people would probably be surprised to, to, uh, to see a guy in Hatriot that would go back and listen to what those guys would probably hate being referred to as, but hair metal, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, another guy, also a hair metal guy, is um, uh, Mark Diglio. He was uh, XYZ. Okay. Okay. Unsung, completely unsung tastiest solos you've ever heard especially on that album hungry oh my god his guitar work is well ridiculous. i've said this before out of here though i think what happened with a lot of those 80s guys was that there certainly were great guys in there but i think the 80s scene was really uh, a lot of those guys were victims of you know style over substance i don't think people really gave them a lot of credit as being musicians because there was so much emphasis put on the glam look and the lipstick and the hair that's got to be five feet five feet high and uh, you, you know i mean you got to have the right costume and the right look and Case in point to that, all the biggest hair bands were arguably the worst ones. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's, yeah. I mean, Motley Crue, you know, made great party anthems, but as far as musicianship goes, yeah, Nikki Six is a great songwriter, but I mean, yeah. you know, who you, you put, put, you know, put, uh, you know, uh, put their put their guitar stuff, you know, against fucking, put Mick Mars up against fucking George Lynch or Warren D. Martini. Yeah, you know right, I mean? right. I mean, you know, put C.C. DeVille up against 
you know, George Lynch, Warren Demartini, Vito Braun. Yeah. You know, I mean, Winger got big, but Winger also was just a bunch of guys that went to music schools and were like, let's make a bunch of money. Right, right, right. Uh, a lot of those guys were just phenomenal musicians. Um, I mainly draw influence off those guys for soloing because, you know, yeah. I don't because, you know, I, I, I don't want to just be a guy who just runs runs crazy licks all the time. I want to have some flavor to it. So Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I take a lot of influence for those guys. Another guy I enjoy listening to, we're going to go more my 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 younger years, but uh, yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Ollie Herbert from uh, all that. Okay. Guy. Okay. Also great lead work, some great risk. Fall of Ideals, basically. That album is all you need to listen to. <laughs> that album's amazing. What about um, some of the Bay? What about some of the Bay Area players? Where do they rank when you think of like your Gary Holtz and your Alex Skolnicks and like guys who have kicked around that Bay Area and been legends for so long? So Bay Area guys, um, Gary Holt definitely for riff writing, absolutely. I mean, Rick, of course, Rick Hunolt, the great Rick Hunolt. Rick, dude, he joined us on stage actually. Uh, I saw the clip. Yeah, it was great, great moment. Rick too. Rick, fucking great. His leads were just always so awesome. oh yeah 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 G yeah you, you, you could always tell when it was him soloing just these beautiful yeah. flicks man i wish i could have a brado like that um fucking uh, and the sad thing and the sad thing is is that holt and hunolt were just for years criminally underrated they really oh, were they never they never got the you didn't really even hear gary holt's name mentioned in in in, in big circles until he really started helping out and, and then joined up with slayer you know i mean that really catapulted him into being more of a household name, but it's criminal that those guys were not given more credit is like one of those great guitar duos in history. Yeah. in their prime, I mean, you know, they, they balanced each other so well and they were so yeah. different at the same, like, you know, Gary's solos were just like these wild reckless things. And then, you know, know. do these beautiful melodic runs, but it worked. Yeah. Um, another Bay guitarist that I think is criminally underrated would be Glenn Avalize. Oh yes. Yes. Dude, that it's, his. His solos in Forbidden, his solos on that he did for Testament, his tenet yeah. solo that yeah. the solos he does on that fucking tenet album are stupid. Well, I think just how I just made the comment about this, you know, the style over substance with the 80s guys, I think what happens with a lot of extreme music is those guys just get credit for just being able to play, you know, really, really fast. But that there's, but, but you know, but, but but there's no technical prowess there. And I don't think people really realize just how hard that really is to do, you know. Oh, and Alex Skolnick, like you mentioned, I mean, what there's he was 17 when <laughs> on, yeah, on the yeah. demo. Yeah. What more needs to be said? He well, was, he's a guy that, he, he's a guy that's really like a, the true definition of like a virtuoso too, because like he could just shift and go into like and, and, and slide right into any lane and play any genre and be very comfortable, it seems. Dude, it, it's like, yeah, I mean on the legacy demo, he was like 17 years old and just ripping solos like he's been playing for 30 years. You yeah, know, like, pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah, the bay the, the bay has has a plethora of talent, and you know what other solos I actually lead work I enjoy is actually for some strange reason is Possessed's first album. Uh, oh yeah, Searches. They're yeah. not the most technically pro esque, or you know what I, I mean, but they yeah. just sound good. Yeah, <laughs> they match yeah. the music really well. Um, well, since you well since you brought up those '80s bands uh, a little while ago, uh, and 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 and. and Kind of talked about you know how much you admire that kind of playing uh something that's really topical right now that i'd like to get your take on uh we mentioned motley crew is the big stadium tour now where do you stand when you see these guys at an advanced age using these backing vocals and and, and backing tracks and clicks and all this stuff do you think that uh, you know do you want to go see the live experience and i've asked other musicians about this and and i have my own opinion about it but i always i always like to leave that out of it and hear you know, from a person that's actually an artist, where do you stand on that? Do you want to see the live thing? You know, even if there's fuck ups and mistakes and it's a little, you know, uh, it's a little bad in some spots or, you know, they need to start the goddamn thing over or somebody fucks up or do you want to see it be pristine and you don't care what these guys got to do, especially the ones at an advanced age. Like when you see like a, a Vince Neil or a Paul Stanley from kiss, you know, and they can't do what they did 30 years ago. Do you have a problem with it? Well, here's here's my deal with that is if you're in a band that advanced and you have the production to have all the backup musicians and singers and stuff, yeah, and you still mess up, what are you doing, dude? I know. You know you can't like you know we're up there and I'm I'm not gonna say I'm without flaw. I've messed up plenty of times during sure. rhythms during everything, but we like to call it a fumble recovery. You know in right. football when the guy right. drops 
what when the guy drops the ball and you you make sure your your team is the one who falls on that ball and doesn't let the other team get it. I like that. You know? Yeah. As quickly as possible, you pick right up and no one even notices half the time. Only you do. Yeah. Um, unless you do such a terrible performance live, which you know a lot of those older cats have. But I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's necessarily their skill that's an issue. There's, I believe, there's probably other mind altering factors or just physical factors there. Drugs, basically. You know? Yes. Yep. Yep. If you're if you're not in the best shape, you're not going to perform the best. So. Right that's usually the that's usually the case with a lot of those older bands that you know but uh as far as like backup singers and click tracks and stuff like that i mean hey if you can pull it off you can pull it off it's not easy playing to clicks and stuff like that it can oh sure sure you know we don't do it because one it, it doesn't really match our music that well but you know uh the band we toured with silver talent i believe they used clicks and stuff because they used a lot of midis and stuff like that backing tracks with their stuff and you know what anything to reproduce what you played on the album hey by all means do it and if you can nail it every night like that that's awesome yeah that's a skill in itself um and as far as like backup singers and stuff like that even that's not a new thing i mean if you look at you go all the way back to like the 50s and stuff and you see like tom jones and so, or somebody right yeah right. like yeah like a 20-piece band behind him playing you know my delilah you right, know what i mean right. it's like that's nothing new and you know i mean what if you have the production and the means to do it by all means do it recreate your product any way you can how about um how about uh another thing that's really topical and uh, i guess by the time i get your episode up it still will be topical because it's not supposed to be happening until next year but where do you stand on the big pantera reunion are you for it are you against it do you like the guys that they got to fill the spots i think it's great yeah Younger fans are going to get to hear Pantera songs live. It's still it's Phil and Salmo singing them. I mean, yeah. Let's be real here. Everyone hate is hating on Phil because he said some stupid. Sh he said yep. some stupid shit, and you know. He did. Yeah. You know, and the other question I have for everybody is: Are you really that surprised that he said that stupid shit? Probably right. not. Right. I right. mean, I'm I'm sure Phil is. You know, he even apologized for all that too, and. He did. You know, I'm sure he's he's behaved since then, and I'm pretty sure he's cleared his name. I, I'm not going to get into the whole controversy of it. Yeah. But as far as like them wanting to do it again, and they got the family's blessing to do it. I mean, they do. Yep, they do. And Charlie, Charlie's a perfect drummer to fill to do Vinny's parts, and Zach Wild. I can't think of another guitarist that could do dime. You know. Yeah. Personally. I really like that choice. Yeah, that choice. I that choice. I really did like. Yeah, that would that that was um. You know that, that I I think they've been talking about it for years, and I feel like they never really had anybody in mind. You know, uh, for the drumming, but I feel like Zach was always going to be the guy to do dimes parts if it ever came to fruition. I I don't think that was ever in question that he that was going to be him. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if you don't like it and you don't want to go, guess what? Don't go. Right, right. Don't go. Yeah, exactly. Don't go. It's that simple. If you're so against it, ninety um, percent of the people. I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna go on a limb and say about ninety percent of the people bitching about it on Facebook right now are gonna end up going to. Those it. are the people that will go. Yeah, those are the people that will definitely be there. Yeah, yeah. There's no doubt about that. No one's focused on being cool. You know, you gotta be cool and edgy on the internet. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's true. Too. Oh, oh, um, my I don't like Pinter's reunion. Yeah. This is a cash grab. This is a cash grab. And you know what? I ain't no cash grab. It's good business. But right, exactly. Right. I think people forget sometimes though that that, that that this is what you guys do for a living. I think just because somewhere along the way it became possible on the internet to steal music that you guys make, that now all of a sudden you know, like you guys don't do this for a profession and you don't deserve to make a nickel off of your money. You know, you guys are, are punching a clock and going to work just like we do in a sense, maybe not in a conventional manner, but you guys have to get together and go in and, and, and make a piece of art that you have to hold that appeals to you know a wide audience of people but yeah and at the end of the day like i said you know i i think the whole pantera reunion thing is great i think they should do it i i think it's long overdue honestly it should have happened when Vinny was alive but you know 
He isn't. It's unfortunate. So. Yeah, it is unfortunate. It didn't it didn't happen? But I don't know if there was going to be any mending of the bridges though with Phil and Vinny though. That that, that, that didn't seem possible when he was still alive. But you know, and it is sad because life is so the short. Phil and Rogan can get back together and play a fucking show. Anyone can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards have a, 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 a allegedly mortally hated each other for decades and still go out and make music together anyway. You know, I mean, that's you know, at least that's the word around the campfire. I mean, I don't know, but. You know, they keep the money train rolling. I'm pretty sure a lot of those bands have been doing it for that long. They all fucking hate each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you you, know somebody that long for that many years. Yeah, you're going to probably hate not like them you anymore. Enough bad stuff about them. That's for sure. Yeah. Um. Well, so uh, um, what is the plan now uh, uh, Now that Veil of, Veil of the Shadows is out? Is it a big tour? Are you guys planning on, on trying to get out onto a, a lengthy tour? Are you guys just going out and doing little pockets of dates and coming back? How are you guys approaching uh, going out and yeah. getting the out there? We're working on uh, getting the ball rolling on some stuff. I can't really talk too much about it. That's but, all right. That's all right. Uh, we're, we're definitely working on some stuff. And uh, when, when it's time for everyone to know, they'll know. All right. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Uh, as far as stuff I can say, I'm actually six songs into the next album already. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I'm sure fans definitely like to hear that. Who are some of the older guys? Who are some of the older guys in that Bay Area scene who you feel like, yeah, you know, if there is anybody, you know, you've obviously, you, you're obviously, you know, you're you're coming up in that scene. There's lots of legendary bands there that have been doing this for 30, 40 plus years. Are there any guys in that scene? Who uh, who have given you any pearls of wisdom or or, or, or given you anything as an up and coming guy yourself? Have you gleaned anything off of? And, I, and I'm talking about just you know out of the combination of the guys in Exodus, Testament, Death Angel. There's so many out there to name that you've obviously you know come in contact with. You know, um, as far as like a lot of wisdom goes, the only one that really like gave me like uh, you know life lessons and wisdom about the business was Zetro. Zetro, because that he's really the only one I really would talk to more more so on a personal level. Uh, that's not without saying like I don't talk to anybody else in the, the the scene. You know what I mean? But when I talk to anybody else, it's like you know they they just come up talk to me, and a lot of the time just have nothing positive to say about what all of us are doing, and yeah, I'm really grateful for that. And you know, like I love all the uh, like every single legend like old school like legendary band that we've played with have been nothing but cool to us yeah nothing you know nothing but awesome to us like the death angel boys have always been great the testament boys have always been great the dri guys have, all of them have just been awesome to us and always were you know made sure that you know we were taken care of when we'd play with them and stuff like that and they've always been cool and you know even when when we run into each other you know just at other shows and stuff they'll always say hi they'll always you know do on all those guys have always been great. I can obviously tell talking to you, and obviously th th this would be very hard for this not to be the case, given the fact that you've, you've been in a band with, with uh, you know, Zetro and his two boys. But, um, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but it's evident you're an Exodus fan. It's, ex it's evident that they're a huge influence on you. Uh, uh, what what period of Exodus is your favorite? Is it the Paul Blayoff stuff? Is it the Zetro years? The Rob Duke stuff? Or or is it all phenomenal to you? Um, honestly, uh, my my favorite Exodus albums. Uh, it's funny. Um, definitely, my my top three favorite Exodus albums. I mean, would probably be uh, they, in, in no particular order. Probably Fabulous Disaster. Obviously, that was the first Exodus album I ever owned. Love it, love it. A classic. Uh, uh, Temple of the Damned and uh, Exhibit A. Okay, okay. So you do like some of the. Uh, 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 so you did like some of the. Musically speaking, the stuff they were doing with Dukes was like musically speaking was phenomenal. And yeah. even you know what? I'm not going to discredit Dukes either. He did a great job. Yeah, yeah. He did a great job on those albums, like Exhibit A and Exhibit B. He did. He did great. Yeah, I think it was hard for me because, uh, uh, you, you, you know, because I grew up in and 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 so much of my teenage years, you know, was, uh, you know, Zetro was the voice of Exodus. So me personally, I had a little bit of a tough time. And that's not to discredit Rob Dukes because you know that stuff oh, no. certainly was hard and heavy. But I just it was hard yeah. for me to hear anybody else singing that band. You know, and you know what? I, I, he did it justice. I think. I mean, he, he did, did a great job. He yeah, did he did. You know, and those aren't easy shoes to fill, and he he didn't no, not at all. Full touring, and they were still doing good with him. So, 
I mean, so, anyone who hates Tom Dukes, I think, is stupid. Like, the yeah. music was great. His voice, his voice matched. I mean, you know, what does it mean right now to have? What does it mean to have label support? You know, what I mean, how imperative is that? Is that to a band in your position that's just kind of getting the engine going and just kind of getting some traction, and starting to get going? How much does a label in today's musical let landscape? How much does a label really help a band? A labels nowadays is just really good for getting your album out on shelves. Yeah, that's what they're the best at. Uh, as far as like touring supports and stuff like that, you know, times have changed in the music industry. The band yeah. usually. I'm pretty sure other labels do that, and I'm not knocking Massacre for this because they're not the only label that does this. They're, right, all, right. Their main focus is to distribute the album out, right, and put it on the shelves, and essentially that's what a record label should be doing, first sure. and foremost, is sure. just getting the music out there and you know getting the product out and getting it bought. Um, as far as like touring support and stuff like that, we usually got to come up with that a little bit on our own. You and, know, and we got to find means to do it. You know. Usually, usually the way it works out now is the tour. We we make sure the tour pays for itself. Like whatever right. we're getting goes back into getting us from point A to point B. Right. Is it pivotal? Is it pivotal? Do you think though? Here at some point, uh, is the plan? And I know you and I don't have a lot of leverage in making this decision, and maybe it's out of your hands uh, uh, to a certain extent. But is the goal of a band in your position, as as me not being somebody that's in the band, is the goal to try to get an opening bill on a fantastic tour, w you know, with a noteworthy band? The the end goal or the the goal for now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a goal right now, a band, a band, a band that's at, at the stage that you are at right now, and just put out, and just put out an album, and still very early in your career. How much does it help, uh, you, you know, your profile to get out there with a band that can really catapult your career? And and how do you do it? Is it out of your hands? Uh, you know, do you have the leverage to kind of pick and choose who you go on tour with? Um, really, I I don't really know how you would do it. I think you just get lucky. Um. We uh, were fortunate enough to do that little tour with Ex Mortis, and that really did wonders for us. I think yeah. that at the end of the day, as long as you're you you do some kind of tour, every, some kind of tour, or some kind of consistent show playing, you'll 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 slowly but surely build your fan base. That's just the yeah. only way to do it. Um, any kind of tour works. Just make sure that it doesn't bury you. You know what I mean? Right. Don't right. don't go for broke on on things that aren't worth going for broke over. If somebody was going to, and, and and obviously this is a little more prevalent with bands who have really, really attained a lot of commercial success. You know, they're able to do this. I'm talking about like uh, paying $1,200 uh, for a Bruce Springsteen ticket. You know I mean? Just to sit in the audience and not even in a good seat. You know, this is what you pay for, for legendary people. But to come and see you guys, you still have to lay out some dough. Why? What would you tell somebody who wants to come and see Hatriot? Hey, you should come and see us because this is what you get from us live. Well, if you come and see us, you'll get a fucking intense ass show live. <laughs> sure. You might get hurt. <laughs> you might not get hurt. Uh, needless to say, we always give 110% every single night. We're loud, we're aggressive, and we're in your fucking face. And. You won't, you know, we're not quite like any other band you've seen live. We yeah, have our yeah. own, we have our own aura. I can comfortably say that. You a lot of the times, a lot of the time, people will come up to us on came up to us on tour and said that just being like, "Holy shit, who the fuck are you guys?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's always nice to hear, right? Like when you actually blow someone, you know, you get people who are there to see somebody else, and then you blow them away. You know, I've been to some shows where that's been a nice, pleasant surprise where you're going to see somebody. And you might not even know who the hell this opening band is. And all of a sudden you're just blown away and you're like, oh my God, I left there with a new favorite band, you know? You know, that's, that's, uh, that's the end goal. I mean, I'm not really trying to blow the other band away, but just, we're not even worried about that. We're just worried about doing the best we possibly can night after night after night when we're on the road, because there are people watching. And even if we, you just make one fan, that one fan is going to tell his 10 friends about you guys. Oh There's, yeah. It, it just cycles out that way. Yeah, you know? yeah. So, so when you are out on tour, um, uh, you know, what is it like being out on tour? Now, you know, you were referencing earlier the '80s bands, and obviously, you know, a lot of those guys 
who survived that era have have, have put down, the, you know, in writing their memoirs. And you hear about the tales of debauchery and all this kind of stuff. A young man out on tour right now. What's it really like out there? Are you in bed at 8 o'clock at night? Are you out there doing blow with the strippers? What are you out there doing? You out there having a good time? Uh, well, usually uh, one night's <laughs> work is uh, you unload your van, you, you set up on stage. Maybe you'll get a sound check. Maybe you won't. Uh, <laughs> Then, you, you know, the local bands, you wait for the local bands to be done. Um, then you probably buy, then the band before you goes on and you start stretching and getting yourself ready to go on stage after that band, maybe catch a few songs from that band set and then wait for them to load off, give them a little hand with some extra stuff. Then you load on, plug your stuff in, make sure it all works. And then you play your show and give 110% and then you load off and Walk around the crowd, shake hands, kiss babies, go see how the merch booth, merch booth is doing, maybe have a drink or two and, you know, talk to some people and, you know, someone will give you a high five and say they love you. And then you load all your stuff up into the van and you have an eight hour drive to the next spot. So you leave from that night and stop at a truck stop somewhere. So it's not super glamorous. You guys are not living the oh, bullet no. boys life. Oh, no, we're not. I think I think uh, this tour, the only chick I actually hit on was one of the bartenders at one of the venues. <laughs> and, yeah, but uh, what you, well, yeah, but at least but at least you get to play the card that you're in a band, though. I mean, that's got to right there be a good entrance way, uh, you, you know, a good entryway, in, you know, into a conversation with chicks. It's got to coast you, and it doesn't work. Uh, oh man. It doesn't have it doesn't have the uh, <laughs> it doesn't have the power it once had. I'll say is it that. because is it is it more powerful when the guitarist is Warren D Martini or Kostya? I I don't know why. Well, I mean, if I was alive in the eighties, you know, like <laughs> my age then, I don't know. Maybe it'd be different, but uh, <laughs> I, I I I can't really answer that. Uh, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's a crapshoot, but most of the times it doesn't work, man. <laughs> Sorry to break it to everybody. <laughs> Dude, so, most of the time you, so most of the time you just go back to that bunk in the bus and you and you crawl into your little casket and you pull your little curtain and that's it. Yeah, or, or we don't even have a bus. We, you know, you kick your you kick your van seat back at the truck stop. And oh, sleep. oh, you guys. Oh, yeah, that's true. You guys are still in van stages right now, right? Well, you guys are. Every once in a while, you get the hotel room if it's cheap, you know, and then you go to get the shower and lay in a bed. Now, when you guys have a van, uh, uh, who does the driving? Is all it by committee? All, all you guys take turns driving. Is there somebody? Is, is there somebody in, in the band? Is there somebody in the band that when they're driving, you feel like you can't sleep because you might be worried and fearing for your life? Oh uh, no, we all no. Do. Most of the time, I'll be honest, most of the time it's Cody driving and he's pretty good at that. He just likes to drive because it helps him stay awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the criteria for, uh, what is the criteria though, or the protocol uh, when it is your shift to drive though? Like what constitutes being the driver? Is it a lot of energy drinks? Is it a lot of, uh, you know, what well, is your secret? What is your secret when you're driving? Whatever works for everybody. Me, I'll pop an energy drink, maybe have a water and just, you know, put yeah. on goofy music. Helps me stay. Okay, awake. so tune. Okay, so tunes are important to drive to, no matter what time of the night it, it is. Can't be anything I enjoy, it's got to be something that's funny to me, and I'll stay engaged. Okay, we like okay. Really horrible music in the wee hours <laughs> driving. Like, we made it through the entire saga of R. Kelly's trapped in the closet. Like, <laughs> this is what goes on with today's metal bands, huh? Here it is, folks. Coach, you hear metal every right? night, so like, you you just you just go into the weird part of music. Let me. Steely Dan, Peg, yeah. the regular, uh, the thong song. Uh, yeah. Well, is it hard, though? Is it hard when you're playing extreme metal music? When you're off stage, you know, do you want to hear music in that genre, or do you go the complete opposite way and say, I've got to decompress by listening to something else other than what I play? Uh, normally in the night, you know, you get your metal fix. And, yeah, when you're in a van, you kind of don't want to hear that. You, you right. want to hear something a little different. You know, like, when I was driving, it was – Actually, it was hella funny. I, I just put it on the shuffle on one of the internet radio things I have, and it played nothing but like early '90s country and hair bands. It was like White <laughs> like Yoakum and like Brooks and Dunn, then like Rat and Dawkin, and then and then like Chris Ledoux, and then <laughs> fucking Bullet Boys. It was and, oh, okay, funny. okay. 
So I'm glad you brought that up. So do the other guys in the band, uh, uh, you, you know, are they the kind of guys that are just like <clears throat> all the time with the metal too, or do they like a break? And 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 how much hassling do they do when you try to slide the bullet boys in? Does that go over well well with the guys in the band? They're used to they're used to me liking the hair band stuff. Uh, the, the 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 stuff that gets the complaints is when I put on the weird gore grind stuff. Yeah. When I put on a lot of those like weird inter- one man gore grind bands on the internet that are just it's barely music. Uh, that's usually when they start complaining. Um, you sometimes after a while the gangster rap will 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 start getting to them. Okay, so so now you said like the music the stuff that's barely listenable and barely and, and and barely music. So as someone that plays heavy music, and and I remember being young and 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 progressing through my heavy metal journey and searching for the next fastest thing, the next most brutal thing, the next thing that was really more terrifying than what we were listening to. But can there be a limit? Can music get oh, too yeah. heavy where it's not enjoyable? Uh, not too heavy, just too ridiculous. <laughs> too ridiculous. Okay, okay. So- Do yourself a favor and look up a band called Sperm Swamp, and you'll understand exactly what I mean. Sperm what? Sperm Swamp. Sperm swamp. Okay, okay, okay. Just listen to that, and you'll understand exactly. There's literally a song that's farts and farts and a blast beat. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating. So that's not music. You couldn't even classify that as music, right? I mean, that's not barely. I, I guess it's considered grindcore, but uh, yeah, it's it's not music. It's art. Okay, it's art. Okay, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so where? So where in the world of heavy metal does having cool facial hair rank? Because you're working a suit. You're you're working something pretty good right now. I don't know. I just did it because. Uh, so this whole thing came to be because I was like shaving my beard, like trimming it up, and my roommate was listening to Motorhead, and I'm like, I'm gonna try it. Okay. Okay. So this is Lemmy inspired, definitely. I can see inspired, that. I did it, and I'm like, this works. I'm 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 keeping this, and then. I'm starting to get a little more right swipes on Tinder, so obviously. Uh, Whoa, something's working then. And has anybody working. ever told? And, and uh, you might be too young to remember, but uh, 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 any recollection of a show called "Welcome Back, Cotter"? Oh Jesus Christ! Yes, because I I'd like to show you right here what I'm thinking that you resemble right here a very yeah. young Gabe Kaplan from "Welcome Gabe Back, Kaplan, Cotter." Yeah. I've gotten I've gotten Gabe Kaplan. You've gotten Gabe Kaplan before. I've okay, okay. Gabe Kaplan. I've gotten. I usually get Gabe, uh, Gabe, uh, Gabe Kaplan. I get Lau Lau Zedo. I get Lau Lau Zedo a lot. John Zach, I get him. Uh, uh, what's his name? Is it Daniel Gibbs from uh, Bloodsport, the tall biker guy? Oh, Ogre from Revenge of the oh, Nerds. Oh, Donald Gibbs. Yeah, Donald, Donald Gibbs. Yeah. Ogre from the Nerds. Yeah. Yeah, I get Donald Gibbs a lot. Um, Vinny Apice's brother. What's his name? I get him a lot too. That's a good one. Yeah, you could be an apathy for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, amongst younger kids, they're all like, you look like Bob Ross. <laughs> Bob Ross. <laughs> then I have to be No mean. painting lessons, though. No painting lessons I for the you, though. You suck at painting. Okay, so you... Actually, one of my sisters is really great at painting, and when I was growing up, she would watch Bob Ross, The Joy of Painting, Channel 6. Yeah? Every day. <laughs> well, hey, so... Uh, so getting back to hatred now, you said you're six songs in. Now you guys have just, you know, you guys are just on the heels of your last release. How soon will we see another hatred album? Are you going to hit us right back again with one pretty quickly, or is this going to sit in the can for a little while? I don't know, honestly. I, I think we're going to try and get it out as quick as we can. Yeah. Who makes that call? Is, is that democracy? You guys all kind of say democracy more so. I think okay. it's a good democracy call. Um, but I mean, you know, as soon as I get all the stuff written and we get it all rolling and ready, I, we, we, you know, we want to at least be a little more consistent with the album releases like we have been granted the, the pandemic, uh, kind of put a, put a gear in the wrenches, but I'm glad it did. Cause it gave us time to really make something special and kind of help right. us collect of what direction we want to go writing wise. Now, obviously, you're not opposed uh, from everything that you said here. And if we review the conversation here, uh, I don't think there's any denying that you were very pro hair metal. Obviously, me, Rex Ruger, being undoubtedly one of the greatest front men to ever do it. I'm thinking of of of, uh, of putting together a timeless sleaze metal band called Love Sword. And I might need your guitar prowess. Let's do it. You're there? You're I'm there, there. Me? Only you know only. What? Only if you make me a guitar that that's shaped like a sword, but with a dick yeah. head. 
A love sword, absolutely. And I'll tell you what, I'll even work on I'll even work on putting Mick Sweet on the other side of the stage for you. Oh, there we go. You know, that's a slice of uh, that's a slice of glam metal heaven right there. Yeah, uh, that that means I have to start like working out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You might have to glam, yeah, you might have to glam it up a little bit. I was actually I actually bounced this idea off uh off uh, Yadron uh, Gonzalez the other day from Ex Mortis, and he's also yeah. down too. So, so the problem I'm having is I'm, I'm getting too many players, so I got to scale it back. So there might be auditions. I don't know when the last time was you had to audition, Coach Jim, but no pressure. Oh, I got it. You got it. I think you do. I, I think you do. So that's going to be great. I'm going to have Yadron, and I'm going to have uh, Gabe Kaplan in my band. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so okay, so uh, uh, Patriot Veil of Shadows. Uh, can find it where all musical platforms anywhere all that music platform, your local music store possibly go out and listen to it it's there amazon it, i think sells them uh the nuclear blast store i believe has some of our vinyls for sale and do you have any other projects to plug any other side projects or is uh or is hatred uh got all your focus right now hatred's got all my focus currently okay uh, i'm in it to win it with them well I'm I'm listen. I'm so happy as a guy approaching fifty years old uh, that, that you know that I can a actually look in, at, at the thrash genre and say it's in good hands. There's a lot of good bands out there. Uh, you know, Gabe Kaplan is doing everything that he can out there post Welcome Back Cotter years to keep thrash <laughs> alive, and he's going to I'm younger. I, I you know I I've been doing P90X and I've, I I'm really. I'm, I've been dead. Isn't he dead? He's been dead for like 10 years. I think so. He? Yeah, I think so. I've been so. dead I for 10 so. years, but you know, P90X, man, I'm in a metal band again. If someone gets married in the Varvaticus family, are there any like the Greek, do you guys do the plate breaking and all that kind of stuff? Or is that just more, is that just more like a, uh, like uh, a bunch of bullshit? Um, you know, there's plate breaking. Um, usually in Cretan weddings, it's more so uh, guns. They shoot guns. Really? Oh yeah. Oh a lot yeah. Of fetish a lot of feta cheese too. Um, actually, no? no, just a lot of lamb. A lot, a lot of, of lamb, yeah. A lot of Sufaki? Oh yeah, yeah, lots of that. And I no. like the uh, and I really like the baklava. My, you know what? That that's every Christmas for me. My mom is it. Is it? My mom baklava? Makes, uh, makes a batch of baklava, and it's yeah, you know, yeah, every time. Well, listen, Coach, man, I really appreciate you, man. Uh, you, you know, I know that we had done this a while back, and. Uh, you know, you were one of the first guys that was kind enough to actually come on and talk to me, man. So I, I wanted to redo your interview to let the audience know I had one in the can with you already, but it was a little grainy. You were a little pixelated and freezing up a little. This one went so much better, man, because I, you know, I wanted a good representation because you guys really are carrying that torch. You are, you are, you're doing it, buddy. You're doing it. Doing it, damn it. You're fucking <laughs> doing it, man. You're keeping thrash alive, man. Hatred is keeping thrash alive. And, uh, you know, I, I, hey, I'm proud of you, buddy. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate you joining me and being so generous with your time, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. I'll, see, I'll talk to you later, Coach. Let's stay in touch and we'll do this again, buddy. Definitely, brother. You take All right. Care. Take it easy, buddy. Peace. Later. Bye. There he is, the Greek sensation himself, Kostya Varvanikis from Great Young Thrash Band, Hatriot. I didn't say Patriot. Hatriot. H A T. R I O T. If you get to a site where you get something that's Hat Riot and they're trying to sell you caps and beanies, you're at the wrong place. Hatriot, their newest album just came out. It's called Veil of Shadows. And you should go listen to it because it's a face ripper. And it's a face ripper because of that guy's guitar work. So go out and check them out. I implore you, I command you. Listen, Pod Scum audience, this is the man, Rex Ruger, telling you to go check out Hatriot. And so I hope you guys enjoyed spending a little time with my man, Kostya. And until next time, thank you for watching Pod Scum. And I uh, would like to tell all you guys to take it easy and keep it sleazy.